was an easy thing, everybody would do it. But it's not an easy thing to build a team. It's not an easy thing to work together. Not when you have human beings involved. Even among the wonderful people of Lumberton, when you have human beings involved, there are tensions and ego bruising and all kinds of stuff that happens among human beings. And that's why a lot of churches, it's just easier to not have a team, or if they do have a team, that everybody kind of does their own thing. They have little silo ministries, and they compete, and they, they kind of almost work at cross purposes. This is my classroom. This is my keyboard. These are my crayons. <laughs> and they can get that foolish. We get into turfism and territorialism and all kinds of stuff that hurt the church. I know that wouldn't happen here, but I'm just talking about all this therapeutic for me, so just listen while I psychoanalyze myself. I know that would never happen. See, this is a team. And Paul said, so we, being many, are one, and everyone remembers one of another. So when Sunday school succeeds, the youth ministry succeeds. And when the music department succeeds, the host, hostesses, the hospitality department, they're succeeding. Because we're doing this together. This, this is one body. And we're servants. How do you know if you have a servant's heart? You get treated like a servant and it doesn't rise up in you. Who do you think you are to treat me like that? That's how you know you have a servant's heart. You don't want to put that to the test. It's very difficult. Now, I want to talk about something that is not specifically scriptural, but I think it, it helps us as team members. And I think Paul gives me permission when he says, so we being many are one. I think he gives me permission to kind of just kind of launch into this little area. I want to talk to you about something that is ancient, uh, but it's, uh, it's still very important today. Some of you have been through something similar like to this at work. Uh, or in some kind of uh, schooling that you've done. Uh, but I want to think about it in the, the, the context of the church today, okay? And, and that is uh, how your personality affects your spirituality. So I want to talk to you about personality and spirituality because not only do we have different roles, some of you are in kids ministry, some in youth ministry, some of you are in hospitality, ushers and hostesses and greeters, uh, some of you are in music ministry, some of you lead worship, some of you teach, and some of you, uh, you, you do all kinds of stuff in the kitchen and set up and whatever, and they're all very valuable. We see that from Acts 6. But we all do things differently, and here's where the challenge comes in. Uh, because I can honor you Although I do music ministry and you do youth ministry, I can honor you if I think you're doing it all the very same way I would do it if I was doing youth ministry. But when you do it differently than I would, that's where the tensions come into a team. And sometimes the devil tries to use that to rise up criticisms of one another. And, 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 and isn't it amazing that as human beings, I can look at you and I can know exactly what your motives are. Your motives are terrible and your motives are evil and your motives are political and your motives are self-serving, but I give myself a pass on my motives. My motives are always pure. Isn't that amazing about human beings? So, so I want to talk to you about this. Now, if you've got paper, I want you to draw this. If not, you, I'm going to rely on your memory. But just make a grid, like, like that cross. Just make a grid with like a window pane with four squares on your paper. Uh, or, or you can do that in your head. If you've got one of those photographic memories, number one, I envy you. And number two, just, just go ahead and do it. So I, I, I want you to, to do a little test with me. Uh, this is a very elementary kind of personality test. And I want you to do this, okay? Um, because this is you, okay? Um, we, we've got two lines. We've got a horizontal line and we've got a vertical line, okay? So on the, um, the vertical line, uh, at the top, if you're writing, and if not, just, just keep this in your memory. Uh, at the top of the vertical line, I want you to put the word tasks. Tasks, things that you have to do. Tasks, jobs, responsibilities. So tasks goes at the top. And at the bottom of the vertical line, I want you to put the word people. So tasks and people, or better yet, tasks and relationships. Okay, tasks, jobs, things to do, and at the bottom, people or relationships. Okay, now, here's what I want you to do. 
You can do this mentally if you don't have paper. Uh, on that line, I, 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 we've got tasks at the top, and we've got relationships at the bottom. And in just a second, I want you to put yourself somewhere on that line. You cannot put yourself in the middle. Do you know why? Because you are not as perfectly balanced as you think you are. <laughs> Nobody goes in the middle. So, so you are either leaning more toward tasks or more toward relationships. Some people lean just a little bit toward tasks. Some people lean a lot toward tasks. Now to explain this before you put your dot on the line, I, I, I want to tell you a little story which is not a, a story really, it's really true. If, if, if you take me and Pastor Jack, who works with me uh, so closely at home, we're very different in personality. Uh, my wife Beverly and I, we're a very different personality. If you take uh, Beverly or Jack, either one of them, it doesn't matter. Um, they're very similar uh, because often we marry who we hire and we hire who we marry. It's just it's amazing, the similarities. When we choose somebody to work with or to live life with, we often choose somebody that's opposite of ourselves. Um, so, so if you send Pastor Jack, let's say, if you send him just before service through a crowded church foyer to go to the tech team and give them uh, a presentation on a USB stick, say, this is very important, we're going to use this as a service. Um, nine times out of ten, he will take that and say yes, and he will go. And he will walk into that crowded foyer, and he will kiss babies, and he will shake hands, and he will hug necks, and he will hear about people's illnesses and problems, and he will do some on-the-spot counseling, and he might pray three or four through the Holy Ghost, and baptize somebody in the water fountain, and, and, and pat dogs, and he, he can do anything up there. And then we'll be sitting on the front pew, and I'll say, we're all good for the presentation. And he will say, and I quote, what? Because he will have totally forgotten the task. Because he's highly relationship-oriented. Now, if you send me through a crowded lobby, the same crowded lobby with all the same people, with all the same pressing needs, and you send me with that job. I will take that immediately to the sound people. I will deliver your instructions verbatim. I will watch them. In fact, I will nag them until they do exactly what you said for them to do. And then I will return and I will give you your USB stick because I will not forget to give that back to you like so many people do. And I will give that back to you. And I will say, mission accomplished, sir. And I might not have noticed that there were people in the void. Because I am highly task oriented. Now you are one or the other and you are not in the middle. I don't care how holy you are or how much Holy Ghost you have. You still have flesh. So you are not in the middle. So on that line, I would like you to put a dot representing where you are. Either you're extreme task oriented or slightly task oriented. Or you're extremely relationship oriented or slightly relationship oriented. Everybody got your dot somewhere in your on your paper or in your head? How many task-oriented people do we have here? Would you lift your hand? Good. And how many relationship-oriented people do we have? And how many of you task-oriented people are married to a relationship-oriented? Yeah, yeah, okay. We'll get to that in a minute. Now we've got a horizontal line. On this horizontal line, I, I want you to put this. Uh, I want you to put slow over here to the left. Meaning relax, not slow, like, okay? Slow and fast, okay? Now, this is your pace of life. This is your pace of ministry involvement. This is your pace when you set out to do something. You're either kind of slow and relaxed and, you know, not, not get too excited about anything. And if there's little diversions throughout the day, you're okay with that. Or you're kind of fast, you're quick, you're like multitasking, doing three things at once. You go, 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 go from the time you get up till the time you lay down at night. Uh, you're either one or the other. You're either slightly one or, or extremely one or you're slightly the other. And you cannot be in the middle because you're not that balanced. So would you put a dot on that line, please? Everybody there? Now... Um, if you have a dot on the vertical line and a dot on the horizontal line, now you have chosen one of the four quadrants of that little chart. You understand? So if you've got a dot up here and a dot over here, then you're in this quadrant. 
If you've got a dot down here and a dot there, you're in this quadrant. So everybody pick your corner, okay? How many know what we're talking about and you got your corner picked, okay? Okay, so for now, we're just going to be corner one, two, three, and four. So one, two, three, four. We'll just do it that way for now, okay? How many of you are in quadrant number one, which would be top left? How many of you are there? Would you lift your hand high? Okay, good. How many of you are in quadrant two? Would you lift your hand high? Very good. Down at the bottom left, quadrant three, how many of you are there? Good. And quadrant four, how many there? Wonderful. So we have a very wonderfully balanced and diverse team here today. And it drives us crazy because they don't do things like you do. And Paul said, we are many. But although we're many different personalities and giftings and preferences, we are one. That's the challenge. And that's why some churches, they, are, they struggle with building a good team because people don't give each other room to be themselves. Okay? Now, quadrant one, up in the top left, I want you to put a word. Now, the personality theory is not new. It was developed about 300 years before Jesus by a guy named Hippocrates, who was a, a Roman doctor, Hippocrates. Uh, and Hippocrates, he had the theory right, but he had the science wrong. He thought we were different personalities because of the <laughs> fluids that flowed in our body. And he gave the personalities different names, and he thought we acted so differently because we had different fluid levels in our body. So we had the science totally wrong, but my goodness, he had the theory totally right. Uh, 2,300 late, years later, we're still doing personality theory in business, in teamwork, in leadership. And if you notice, there are all kinds of different personality profiles. There's colors, there's Myers-Briggs, which is the granddaddy of the personality profiles. Uh, but all of them are based on four quadrants. Myers-Briggs has 16 personality types, but guess what? 16 is a multiple of four. So, so it's the same theory. Colors is four colors. There's one that's based on animals. There's the beaver, the otter, the retriever. golden retriever. Yeah. Uh, I heard of one one time that was based on machinery, and my personality type was the bulldozer, and I really liked that one, but I forgot that one. So. But, but, but we're going to use his classic names, and then I'm going to give you a modern name. Okay, so top left corner. How many of those do we have again? Quadrant number one. Would you raise your hand? Okay, uh, Hippocrates called you the melancholy people. The melancholy people. And he thought you were melancholy because you had black fluid, bile, flowing through your veins. <laughs> I have met some people that I thought that was true, but it's not really scientific. <laughs> We're going to give you a different name. We're going to call you the perfect people, okay? Oh, Everybody put the word perfect in quadrant one. Oh my now, goodness. Now, unfortunately for you, that's not because you're perfect. It's just because you want the rest of us to be perfect. <laughs> so that's, how many perfect people do we have? Would you raise your hand again? Look at that. The numbers are dropping. <laughs> okay, very good. Okay. Now, in quadrant number two, he called you... Uh, this is top right. He called you the choleric people. The choleric people. Uh, choler is an ancient word for anger. You're kind of the, to the drop. Uh, choleric people. We're going to call you the powerful people. The powerful people, okay? How many of those do we have again? Quadrant two? The powerful people. Okay, very good. Okay. Now, quadrant three, down at the bottom left, uh, he called you... The phlegmatic people. He, it's because he thought you had too much phlegm in your body. And, and I've met a few that I thought he was right, but not many of them. Phlegmatic. We're going to call you the peaceful people. Okay? The peaceful people. And finally, in this quadrant over here, which is bottom right, uh, he called you the sanguine people. Sanguine. We're going to call you the popular people. <laughs> okay. How many peaceful people do we have? Would you raise your hand? Peaceful. Okay, very good. How many popular people? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Very good. Now, we're just using those modern names just kind of as handles. So uh, here's what I want to go back and take a look at because although we're all very different in our personalities, Paul says we are many, but we're called to function as one body. That's where it gets difficult. If you did everything like me, I wouldn't have a problem working with you. 
<laughs> really, I wouldn't. It's when you do things different than me that I have some challenges on the team. Because I think you're slacking when you're just doing it different. <laughs> oh, somebody, that was your word from God for the day. Go to this. Okay, so, so here we go. Uh, top left, quadrant one, the perfect people. These are people that are highly task-oriented. You give them a job to do, and it will be done, but they are slower moving. They're very detail-oriented. So it will be done, and it will be done right, but it will be done slow. <laughs> Because they're wanting to make sure it is perfect before they come back to you. Meanwhile, you're thinking, where did my job go? And why haven't they done it yet? Now, you're going to be pleased with the end result because it's going to be meticulous. But my goodness, they can take a while, some of these folks, to do something. Now, on the other side of the top, you have the powerful people. The powerful people are also task-oriented. All that matters to them is results. But they're very fast moving. They're a blur. They can go from one thing to the other thing to the next thing to the other thing, back to the first thing, before you've batted an eye. They're just always moving. They've got more plans for the... You know, you've heard the saying, it comes from the denominal world, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Powerful people, they love you, and they have a wonderful plan for your life. And it involves you doing exactly what they say as soon as they say it. Right now. Yesterday would be a lot better. Conviction is setting in. If you ever make the mistake of going on vacation with these people, you will come home exhausted. You will have torn the ruins of every ancient civilization and all the wonders of the world, and you will only add two days. <laughs> Powerful. They're task-oriented, and they're uh, fast-moving. Then down in the lower corner, you have uh, the peaceful people. Now, they are um, they're relationship-oriented. Tasks don't matter to them as much. It's not that they don't matter, but it's they, they don't matter as much as people. So they're never going to let getting the task accomplished get in the way of having relationships with people. These people make wonderful counselors. Uh, they're, they're very patient with working with people because relationships matter to them. And they're calm and peaceful about it. They are the people that kind of have the, the spirit, you know, let's just all get along. Let's just all work together. Uh, these people are wonderful on a team because they kind of um, they, they kind of massage everybody's feelings and make sure nobody's getting hurt by the powerful people. <laughs> They're awesome. But to some of the other personality team types, they move so slow um, because they're just always about relationships. They will stop to talk to a dog. <laughs> woof, woof, woof. woof. They're, just, they're all about relationships. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm having a little fun. Okay, finally over here we have the popular people. Now, they are relationship oriented, but they're very fast. And they go from one person to another to another. And if you see them in the foyer, they might be talking to you. But they're looking over your shoulder at the next person that they're going to talk to. And they're fun. And if they were unsaved, they would be the person on top of the table with a lampshade on their head singing a song. <laughs> they're wonderful, crazy, fun to be around, but they will exhaust you. Oh, my goodness. They build supermarkets for sanguine people. They go in for milk and bread, and it's like, tacos! <laughs> so, so, so that's the sanguine people. One more time, um, I need you to lift your hands. Do not lie, check out, or... Okay, so how many perfect people do we have here? Would you lift your hand? Very good. Unashamed. Lift your hand. How many powerful people do we have here? Would you lift your hand? Very good. How many peaceful people do we have here? Very good. How many popular people do we have here? Okay, so we have major church problems here. <laughs> Fixing the world. Unless 
we let the Holy Ghost help us that we, being many, work as one body. And then we have a wonderful opportunity here. Because what is not my strong point is your strong point. And what is not my gifting is your gifting. And what I'm not patient with, you are patient with. And what not, I might not do well, you can do well. It's incredible. This is how we build great, great teams. So I, I want to go back and I want to revisit each personality type because I really want to pour it on today and, and let you know kind of where we are with this. Uh, and I'm going to start not with the perfect people because it will really mess them up that we've started with them every time, but we're not starting with them this time because they're in a perfect world. So I'm not starting with them. In fact, I might just leave them to the end, just to spite them. Uh, I, I want to start with the popular people. Everybody say popular. 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 Uh, popular people, they have this incredible strength that they bring to our team. Their major strength is enthusiasm. They can get in excited about launching a firecracker in the parking lot. Come on, everybody, come see! Hey. They bring this incredible enthusiasm to the team. Now, they are motivated internally, and this is not evil or wrong, this is just the way their personality is wired. They are motivated by recognition. They want everybody to see what it is so fun that they are doing. Come on over, come on, everybody, come on! They're, they're just enthusiastic and they're motivated by recognition. Their basic desire on a team, now this is important what we're hitting into. Their basic desire on a team is fun. They want it to be fun. Now, that speaks to me because 25% of the population, give or take, is popular or sanguine. Um, that means that if it's not fun, they're going to check out. These are the people that will not respond if everything we ever do as a church is crank and cry. Crank and cry, crank and cry. You know, we're going to crank up your emotions, and then we're all going to cry, and then we're all going to go home. Now, that may work for the melancholies. The melancholies might want to have a month of that. <laughs> but not the same ones. So, so sometimes we need to make it different. It's not wrong to do different things as a church. I heard in the announcements last night that you've got different things coming up. And that's wonderful. That, that's not because we've stopped having church. We're still being the church. We're just in a different format. And we can have fun and laugh together. And that part of the population, they think, wow, church isn't so bad. Church isn't so sad. Church isn't all about crying or feeling guilty. Church can be fun. So that's good. And the sanguines lead the way in that. Their basic desire is fun. Now, the sanguines have a major weakness. Because every personality type, to get their strength, you're going to also get their weakness. And the major personality weakness of the sanguines is they're impulsive. Let's go do this. No, 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 no. Let's go over here and do this. No, wait a minute. Just stop for a minute. Let's go do this. They will drive the rest of us absolutely crazy. Now, they're excited about whatever it is they're doing for that 30 seconds. But they could be doing something totally different in the next 30 seconds. And they will exhaust you if you try to keep up with them. They're impulsive. And that's why they do build, they really do. They build supermarkets for the same. Tacos! <laughs> now, every personality type has a behavior when they get under tension. If you push back at them, if they get in a stressful situation, they lapse into a certain behavior. And, and the sanguine personality, they're so bubbly and cheerful and happy and fun until they don't like what's going on. And then this, this wonderful, flamboyant, fun personality, they will attack you. They will turn that quick wit into quick barbs that hurt and sting, and they can be very sharp-tongued if they get angry. It's their weakness uh, as a personality. Uh, when they get under tension, they use that same sharp, quick wit to hurt people. <laughs> Conviction is just moving in this <laughs> Every personality, in addition to having a behavior under tension, they have a behavior to try to control the rest of us. And for the sanguines, that behavior, when they're trying to control the rest of us and get the rest of us to do what they want us to do, they turn on the charm. 
Oh, especially bad down south. Oh, honey baby doll. You are the greatest thing. They don't believe a word of it. They're just turning on the charm because they want you to do what they want you to do. And so that's the sanguine personality. Now, now the conviction is settled in. How many popular people again do we have? Look at that, look at that. Cut now. Come on, lift up your hand. Popular people. Very good, okay. So now you gotta know the 411 about them. Now, next we have the peaceful people because we're not doing the perfect people yet because it will kind of mess them up because we started with it first every other time. Uh, peaceful people. They have a major strength that they bring to the team. A major strength. And their major strength is people skills. These are the, the people that can kind of calm ruffled feathers and still the waters. And, and they just have this knack of dealing with people. Beverly's like that. Oh my goodness. She's so patient and whatever. Like, she can talk to a wrong number for 45 minutes. <laughs> it's like, who is that on the phone? I don't know. <laughs> Some of you are laughing because you've done that. So the peaceful people on the team, they're motivated by relationships. They're not motivated by recognition. In fact, a lot of times they're in the background. But they're motivated by relationships. They literally want everybody to get along. They're, 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 that's what they want. And their basic desire behind that is not fun like the Sanguins. Their basic desire is peace. Their theme song for life is peace, peace, wonderful peace. Like they want peace. They don't do well with conflict. And so this is important because 25% of the population is like this. And if we're part of a church that's always got conflict and politics and infighting and gossiping going on, they are not going to join a church like that. They, they can't take it. They're, they're not wired for that. They want peace. They, they, they don't do well with conflict. And, and so their the basic desire is peace. Now, they have a major weakness too. Because you can't get their strength without getting the weakness because the strength brings the weakness and the weakness brings the strength. They work together. And their major weakness is they are reluctant. They're reluctant to decide. They're reluctant to state their opinion. They're reluctant to make a decision. Oh my goodness, it drives me crazy. Uh, uh, somebody will call and say, do you want to go to wherever? I just pick a place. Do you want to go to Seattle this summer and see the Space Needle and drive down to Washington and look whatever? It's like, when? Next week? Sure. And I'm done. I'm good. If I say the same thing to Beverly about like two and a half years from now, would you like to go to whatever? She's saying, well, let me think about it. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's two and a half years away. Let me think about it. And I know she'll want to think about it for two and one quarter years. <laughs> I probably pray about it and talk to a hundred people about it. And then she still won't know if I ask her a month out. So just decide now. Um, and it's unbelievable uh, that they're reluctant. Now, they have a behavior under tension too. When you put a peaceful person under tension, they have this long, 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 uh, fuse. They're, they're just incredible. They're, they're peaceful. They want peace. They'll, they'll take it on the chin themselves to keep peace on the team. But they have this behavior that drives the rest of us crazy. Uh, when, when they get under tension, and when you're pushing them for a decision, they just acquiesce. They just give up. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll do that. No, you don't mean that. You're just saying that. I mean, you know, Beverly does that. To, to me, it's like, you know, you're in a supermarket and you see this mother and she's got this three-year-old and he wants candy, but she won't give him candy. And she tells him he can't have candy. And then he just kind of... <laughs> and she has to drag him out of the supermarket by his foot because, okay, if I can't have the candy, I'll just give up. <laughs> Peaceful people, you do that. Okay. Well, if that's what everybody wants. But you're reluctant to decide. And it's like they want to keep all their options open to the very last second. 
They just, they, they acquiesce. Now, so, so here's their controlling mechanism, which you can guess. Their controlling mechanism is procrastination. Why put off till tomorrow what you could put off till next month? <laughs> they procrastinate, they put it off, and put it off, and put it off. So, so those of you that are the peaceful personality, you've got to realize that while you're just trying to keep your options open, you are driving the rest of us crazy. <laughs> and so it helps if you keep that in mind about yourself and about your interaction with the team. But these are incredible relationship building people. If we don't have them on the team, we would have a lot more conflict than we have on our teams. They're so valuable. Now, next we're going to talk about the perfect people because I don't want to leave them to last because then that would feel like we just reversed it and it would be too perfect. So I'm going to put them third, okay? Because I really want to kind of drive them crazy. Uh, how many perfect people do we have here? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Let me pick on you for a while. The major strength that these people bring to the team is accuracy. They get it right. They, they, they do it with excellence. Now, they may be working on the one PowerPoint slide for three and a half years, but it will be the best PowerPoint slide you have ever seen. When people see that PowerPoint slide, they will be slain in the spirit. Because it has taken three and a half years to get it exactly right. They are motivated not by recognition, not even by relationships. You know what motivates a perfect person? Being right. That's all they need. I'm right. If they feel like they're right, that's enough. The world is good, the sun is in the air, and I'm right. Now their basic desire in life, and on our team, and in our church, is perfection. That's all they want. Perfection. They want everything to be perfect. That's their desire. And, and so, if you have these people on a team, they're going to push us toward excellence. And if the rest of us can listen to them and keep from killing them, they will help us tremendously. Because they will raise the bar on excellence. They see things that the rest of us don't see. And there's 25% of the population like this. And if they come to church and everything's just kind of thrown together and kind of messy and we waste a bunch of time and, and we're not, we don't have our act together, uh, that's not going to be a church that appeals to them. So these volunteers and these team members, they really help us in that area. Now, their major weakness, because every personality not only has great strengths, but has a great weakness, their major weakness is they're too thorough. They, 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 they spend too much time on the detail. Uh, they can uh, really slow things down while they're getting everything just so, just perfect. They're, they're wonderful people to have in like accounting and book work because you need people like that. If somebody's going to build a 747 that I have to fly on, I just assume they do it perfect. Uh, so they're wonderful team members. But, but the thing is, some things don't deserve that much perfection. And, and those of you that this is your personality type, you can help the rest of us if you realize that sometimes we get it to a certain point, and that's going to be good enough this time around. We'll increase the level of excellence a little bit more and a little bit more over time. So, so that's, that's where you can help us. Now, they have a behavior under tension. Their behavior under tension, if, if there's conflict on the team, they just avoid the rest of us to death. <laughs> they just go in their little room, put their nose in their little laptop, and they work on that perfect PowerPoint slide, and they ignore the rest of us. It's not helpful, but they do it anyway. And they have a controlling mechanism, too. They, this is the melancholy or perfect temperament. Many musical people are this temperament. Uh, they call this the musician's temperament. Many musical, gifted people are, are of this temperament. Um, and they, they are very uh, emotional people, not flamboyant emotion, like the popular people, just very deep emotion. Oh my goodness, it's deep. And they, they, get, they control by the threat of moods. Like, uh oh, I think they're sad. Everybody walk very silent. And, and they control by the threat of moods. Nobody wants to get them in the mood. Because a mood for a melancholy could last for years. <laughs> and so that's kind of how they control the rest of us. Um, again, you don't get the positive part of that personality 
without putting up sometimes with the negative part of that personality. And that's true for all of us. Now, uh, now that we've picked on the perfect personality, let's pick on the powerful personality, which happens to be my uh, major uh, personality. The powerful person, they bring an incredible strength to the team, and it is initiative. These are the people that want us to all run out and take hell with a water pistol. Let's go, come on. What are you waiting for, come on. But pastor, uh, we don't have any money. Doesn't matter, let's go. <laughs> pastor Jack said to me one time, we can keep going at the pace we're going, but we're not gonna have any volunteers by the end of the month. To which I said, Beatings will continue until we're not approved. <laughs> so their major strength is initiative. They are motivated by one thing. They're motivated by results. Let's get it done. It might not be perfect, but let's get it done. We might have blood on the walls and bodies in the ditches, but let's get it done. We might all end up in jail, but heaven's sake, let's go do something. That's their major strength, initiative. They're motivated by results. Now, their basic desire is very simple. For those of you that work with other uh, people on your team and their powerful personality, their desire is very simple. They only want one thing, control. You give them control, nobody gets hurt, everybody's happy. <laughs> That, that, that's it. Now, so as a result of their basic desire being give me control, uh, their major weakness is they can be just a little bit insensitive. Just a little bit. Um, at home, uh, we have, you know, we, we're not big into titles or positions or whatever, but we have, I think, quite well defined roles. Pastor Jack is the nice pastor. If you need compassion, his office is over there. <laughs> if you need somebody to set you straight and tell you what you're doing wrong, come on in. I'll tell you. Um, we can be a tad insensitive. I, I heard this story about a church that had lost their senior pastor. He died. And there was an assistant pastor there who had been there for several years, but he was an assistant to the pastor, and it was one of those denominational churches where really they only show up on Sunday. So they literally had no idea what he did during the week because he assisted the pastor. He didn't have a defined position or whatever, and he was just the assistant to the pastor. So they kind of wanted to keep the guy. He was a nice guy. And so they, the board of that particular church met with the assistant pastor and said, you know, we'd really like to keep you on the team, but we're embarrassed to tell you that we really don't know what you do from Monday through Friday. And so can you just kind of tell us your job description of what you've been doing for the last several years to assist the pastor, and we'll see if we can carve out a job for you in the next uh, administration of the church. He said, well, really, I only do one thing. And they kind of looked at him. He said, I just follow the senior pastor around everywhere he goes, everybody he meets with, and I follow him behind, uh, and I come behind him, and I say, he didn't mean it. He, he didn't mean it. He didn't mean it. That's Pastor Jack at CCC. Uh, so they have a behavior under tension. The psychologists would call it the autocratic behavior. In, in other words, their behavior under tension is just give me more control. <laughs> you gave me control and we're in this problem, so just give me more control and nobody gets hurt. That's their behavior under tension. <laughs> and they control by the threat of anger. It's not moods, general, it's just one mood. If they get angry, everybody wants to run for the hills. Now, you say, oh my goodness, this is our team? Yeah, this is our team. It's called humanity. We being many are one. Now, let me give you three personality principles, and then we'll kind of jump back to Scripture, because that will make us feel spiritual when much, much of this isn't spiritual. Uh, but it's very important, folks. Because if we don't understand that, we're expecting everybody to act and react and decide and prioritize like we do. And when they don't, we get frustrated with them, and we think they're not doing their job, or at least they're not doing their job very well. And that's not true. Different doesn't mean wrong. Right. Different doesn't mean bad. Different just means different. They're a different personality. Now, here's some personality principles. Number one, we've already said this. Every personality has strengths 
Everybody say strengths. strengths. So, so you get these wonderful strengths. You get the people skills of the peaceful, and you get the accuracy of the perfect, and you get the initiative of the powerful, and the enthusiasm of the popular. You get these wonderful strengths. But the first principle is every personality has strengths and corresponding weaknesses. Not just weaknesses, but corresponding weaknesses. In other words, you can't get the strength of initiative without getting the weakness of they're a little bit insensitive because they're so results focused. You understand? So it's, it's, you get a strength with every person in this room, but you get a corresponding weakness with every person in this room. That's the way it is on every team, everywhere, not just here. Principle number two. People are most effective in situations that utilize their strengths. One of the old wrong philosophies of leadership and management and team building was that you put people in a place where they need improvement. Uh, if they need help with their people skills, you put them on the front line of working with people and that will improve them. Years of work in business and in church and in team leadership have proven that totally wrong. You can put somebody in their area of weakness and they'll get marginally better. But you put them in their area of strength and everything starts clicking and things start moving and wonderful results start happening. So it's, it's foolish to put somebody in an area of weakness and expect them to succeed and them to be a major blessing to the team in that area. Uh, you know, so for this reason, we don't put um, melancholy people uh, to the best of our ability. And we, we're, you know, this isn't an exact science, but we don't put pure melancholy people on, on the hospitality team. Welcome to church. Here's your ball. Welcome to church. Here's your ball. Welcome to church. No, we put a sanguine on the hospitality. Welcome to church! <laughs> Hallelujah! We're glad to see you. Come on over here. Look at this. Tacos! <laughs> and everybody that comes in the door, they think, wow. Now, for some of them, their necktie's like blown over their shoulder. Their hair's all blown back. Like, good. But they'll get over it. It's okay. There's the rest of us in the sanctuary. <laughs> So you put people, now you do want a melancholy, you do not want sanguines in general doing your church books. You will be in jail and your name will be on the front page of the paper. Because they're not patient enough, they don't have enough attention span to count up a column of numbers. Taco! So, <laughs> so we put melancholy people that are very detailed and very particular, very perfect we want them to handle church finances. Do you understand the principle? So we put people in places that utilize their strengths. And, and number three, now this is really important. We need to appreciate their strength. That's easy. They're so good with people. They're so good with numbers. They're so good at getting results. They're so good at having fun and, and leading things and, and making it all fun. It's easy to appreciate the strength, but here's the flip side. We appreciate their strength and we adapt to their weakness. We realize that not everybody is good at everything. So we don't expect everybody to be good at everything. Meaning, being translated from the original Greek, they are not just like you, and they're not going to do everything just like you do it. So we have to keep that in mind. Now, um, opposites attract. Everybody ever heard that? Opposites attract? That's true in friendships, that's true in team ministry, that's true in uh, marriage. How many of you in this room that are married, your spouse is a different personality type than you are? Would you raise your hand? I rest my case. Now here's the deal that you married people already know and the rest of us might need to learn. Opposites attract, and then about two weeks later, opposites attack. <laughs> The married people already knew that. The rest of us have to learn it. Um, because we can put up with them for a little while because we love their strength. Um, if I was married to a person like me, there would be a double homicide. Because we would shoot each other first. Um, so I'm married to Beverly. 
and, and I work with Jack, and it amazes me. Uh, the person I chose to spend my life with and the person I chose to be the closest uh, leader to me on the team, they are so much alike. There are days I would like to knock their heads together, <laughs> throw them both in a big garbage bag, and throw them in the river and tie to the river. <laughs> but on the rest of the days of the year, I'm very grateful that they're different than me. Uh, because they're very patient and they're, you know, they, they have wonderful people skills and, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm very grateful for them. So we have to keep this in mind as we're working together as volunteers because we don't get Act 6 and Act 7 and Act 8 and God using volunteers if we're all criticizing each other all the time. Mm -hmm. And if we're all kind of working at cross purposes and if we're always suspecting somebody else's motive. Uh, please hear me. And this was very difficult for me as a leader. Uh, just because they move slower than you doesn't mean they're less effective than you. That's good. Mm -hmm. Just because you've got five things on the go today and they've got one thing on the go today doesn't mean they're doing less work for the team. Their work, their gifting is different. And that was very difficult for me to learn as a leader. It really, really, really was. Uh, for me, and my context may be different than yours, I am a uh, a pastor and I, I do have a position at a church and I do get a paycheck from a church and I do have an office at the church. But I think you can make the application here to you as a volunteer leader in your church. Early on in my relationship with Pastor Jack, this would have been 2002. Now I taught him in Bible college and we had worked together at another church for about eight years. But I came back to Fredericton, my hometown, as senior pastor in 2001. And he followed a year later in 2002. He has now been there, coming up to uh, 16 years this, this coming June. Credible, loyal, faithful, godly, <coughs> gifted man. Privileged to work with him. When I don't want to kill him. <laughs> because it alternates. Some days I really appreciate him, and some days I want to bang his head against a wall. And I know he probably feels the same about me. Um... Early on, I really felt like my job as a leader was to help my team with all of their weaknesses. Help them. Which being interpreted is help them become more like me. And in particular, Pastor Jack, because he is the next pastor of our church that's already been decided. He's very critical and, and very key to our success as a church. So I, I think I doubled down on him. I, I really felt like, my goodness, I need to really help this guy because he's going to be our future. And we would have many conversations back then about, you know, Jack, you need to do this better. And you, you need to be more organized. And, and for heaven's sake, you need to use a calendar. Because to him, it's like every day is a new adventure. Me, I've got stuff on my calendar for 2019. And I wonder what's wrong with people that don't. Uh, you know, he's just totally opposite. He said to me one time, I, I, I didn't punch him, I just felt like it. He said to me one time, well, my calendar is really your calendar because you just tell me what to do and I do it. It's like, what? <laughs> just a different personality, very relaxed, very people-oriented. Now, if, if, if anything breaks down, if an emergency happens, if anything goes awry with the plan, you don't want me around. I'm just sitting there thinking, who broke this, and who are we going to behead in the, on the platform next week? But Jack was like, we can fix this. Where's the duct tape? And he just goes and he just kind of fixes stuff. He's incredible, but he's not like me. I remember like it was yesterday. One of those conversations, it was yet another conversation in a long chain of conversations where I was explaining to him the way more perfectly, telling him how to be more like me as a leader. Jack is not like me. I, I'm very kind of emotional. I cry easily. Uh, my goodness. He, he's not emotional. Like he, the only time I ever see him cry is when he's worshiping or preaching or if something traumatic happened in his family, of course. But he's not a crier. And on this day, he's sitting there on the chair in my office and I'm just having another one of these conversations. This has been years ago now, more than a decade. And uh, he started to cry. And I thought, oh my goodness. And he said to me something that changed my life. He said, I guess I'll just never measure up. And he hung his head and he just sat there and cried. And I'm looking at this grown man 
crying in my office because I made him feel insignificant. And that day changed my life. And I hold my leadership forever. We got straightened around. We're good friends. He went on his way. We were fine. I went on my way. We finished up the day. Went home. Everything was good. But after he walked out of the office, if God's ever spoken to me, God spoke to me that day. And he said, now God doesn't speak to me in audible voices. I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I'm not that spiritual. That would scare me to death. <laughs> uh, but God gives me very strong impressions, and I know it's him. And if God has ever spoken to me, he spoke to me that day and said, what do you think you're doing? And so since God didn't understand what I was doing, I tried to explain to the all <laughs> God's ever spoken to me, he spoke to me very clearly. He said, if you succeed in making Jack exactly like you, you will not be able to do what I've called you to do, and he will not be able to do what I've called him to do. So stop it right now. If God's ever spoken to me, he spoke to me so clearly. And with God's help, I tried my very best to stop doing that, to stop expecting everybody on the team to do it exactly like I did. And I'm the leader. And that's not always easy. But I've learned that when I let other people go at their speed, and when I let other people operate in their area of gifting, it's amazing to me what gets done around the Church of the Living God through a group of relatively unskilled people, me included relatively ungifted people, me included. But God puts us together as a team, and we being many are one. Now that little scripture we started with was Romans 12, and if you flip a couple chapters, you end up in Romans 14, and you start reading Paul's writings about meat. Very strange to us. It was a major issue in the church of the day that the Christians who'd been around for a while, they thought nothing of going down to the marketplace and buying discounted meat. And the reason it was discounted was because it was already kind of partially cooked. It had been offered as a sacrifice on the altar of a pagan temple. And they're all praying to this pagan idol or whatever. Well, the Christians knew. It wouldn't matter if you prayed over that hunk of steak for four days in front of that idol. That idol's nothing. It's a hunk of rock. So they would save the money, which gives me great comfort because the apostolics of the first century, they love to eat and they loved a good deal. Uh, so, so I think we're, we're good. Um, they would go to the market and they would buy this meat that had been offered to idols and they would eat it and they wouldn't feel guilty because they knew that praying over a piece of meat in front of an idol didn't do anything to the meat. So they saved the money and they ate the meat. But now there's new Christians coming into the church and they're from the pagan Gentile culture and they're a new believer, but four weeks ago, they were prostrate on the ground in front of that idol praying over that hunk of meat. And it is offending them that the Christians are buying meat at the, at the market that was offered to idols, and they're, they're distraught about it. What do you mean? Four weeks ago, I was bowing down in front of that idol. That spirit behind that idol had to be bound, and so they're offended. And like he does every single time, Paul says, you that are mature, you that have been around for a while, you that, you know, you, you have the history of the, of the church down. You're a mature Christian. We need to bear the infirmities of the weak. So Paul says, we need to be careful about this meat issue. Now, here's, here's what I know. We don't have a meat issue anymore in the church in North America in the 21st century. But what Paul's talking about is don't let your preference become a stumbling block to your brother. Don't let your preference of the way you do things and your liberty become a stumbling block. So I, I want you to listen to these final three scriptures about meat. But I want you to not think about meat because we don't have that issue. I want you to think about an issue that we do have. We all have our own preferences. And if we insist on my preference and my way or the highway, we damage the team, 
We damage the work of God and we can damage new believers in the revival God wants to give us. So let me conclude right here. Romans 14, verse 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now you are not walking charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. I want to give you the 21st century version. If your brother is grieved because of your preference, now you're not acting in love. Don't destroy him with your preference for whom Christ died. <clears throat> Romans 14, verse 20. <clears throat> My goodness, this verse convicts me. For meat, destroy not the work of God. For preference, don't destroy the work of God. Because we didn't meet your preference, don't tear down somebody else on the team. Because we didn't do it the way you preferred, or you didn't win the vote on the color, or the carpet, or the building, or the whatever comes in the future. For your preference, don't destroy the work of God. And Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So here's the deal. The kingdom of God is not about your preference. The kingdom of God is not about your particular personality type. The kingdom of God is not all about your strengths and we all should try to be more like you. No, we all should try to be more like Jesus because here's what I believe. There is no dot for you in the center of that grid, but Jesus belongs there. He's the perfect balance of personality. Yes. And so if we become more like Jesus, we become more tolerable to each other. We become more gentle toward each other. We become more accepting and more inclusive of each other. So the goal is not for you to become like me or my team to become more like me or Pastor Jack to become more like me. My goal is for me to become more like Jesus and everybody else on the team become more like Jesus because my goodness, then we can work together effectively and we can see in Lumberton the revival that God has for this church. Right. Some of you right. may never have a position that's paid at the church and that's good because it was the people that weren't in paid positions that pushed the church from Acts 6. The rest of the book of Acts is because of people like Philip and Stephen. We only read about the Apostle Paul. That's one man's story. Most of the early church, you don't know their name, but they witnessed and they taught Bible studies and they didn't have charts, but they had all scrolls of scripture and they had scripture memorized in their mind. And as volunteers, they pushed the church into its greatest revival in the first century. I would suggest to you that we need the same kind of volunteer spirit, the same kind of servant spirit, and the same kind of teamwork spirit in the New Testament. Paul wasn't like Peter. Peter wasn't like Paul. They had one very public disagreement that's actually written in the scriptures. The disciples weren't like each other. Peter was the, oh my goodness, Peter was the, the, the choleric. Put your foot in your mouth, say it before anybody else thinks that he was that guy. Let's go. Let's grab our sword. Malchus loses an ear. That's Peter. And then you got John, the beloved, reclining his head on Jesus' shoulder. So <laughs> peaceful. How in the world did those guys ever work together anyway? You know, John's gospel is really amazing. I'm going to be talking about the gospel of John in church tonight. But, but John, John's gospel is very amazing. You know why? Because it's pretty obvious in John's gospel that John and Peter had a little bit of a tension between them. John is the only gospel writer that doesn't write about Peter being the first one to call Jesus the Messiah, thou art the Christ. He, uh, he doesn't write about that. In fact, John writes about things like, you know, here's Peter walking on water, falling into the water, while the rest of the disciples <laughs> are holding onto his boat so it doesn't float away in the storm. Peter comes across looking a little bit stupid sometimes in John's gospel. They're very different personalities. The way John writes, <coughs> he, he, he tells us that he was the one who had his head reclining on Jesus' shoulder while Peter's just shooting off his mouth. Jesus likes me best. He even tells us in the gospel of John that I'm fast with Peter. I beat him in a race to the garden too. I got there first. He does. <laughs> These are the people that were the founders of our faith. They were the first disciples. Very, very different. Different giftings, different personalities. 
and yet God used them to change the world. So if we want to change our world, we need to learn how to work together better than ever before. That's right. Serve together better than ever before. Volunteer together better than ever before. Because the future of this church is not dependent on what the government does, or the banking system does, or the economy does, or the culture decides. The future of this church depends on you. Right. You're the A team of the Pentecostal just take the hand of the person beside you, just make a big change of people across this building, and let's pray together before we dismiss.